Good afternoon, um, church. Um, this is Kevin DeClaren coming to you live. Um, and I uh, want to just uh, express my gratitude um, for God bringing us back into this room again. I thought that I lost the library <laughs> and I was kind of um, concerned there for a while and, and thought maybe, wow, you know, I'm going to have to do this, this work outside. And uh, But the Lord was able to bring us back and I am grateful that we're here. Um, I didn't exactly write the entire outline um, on the board. My pen here, uh, the library didn't have the black pen, and the pen that I have is, uh, is the marker. Is uh, You can barely see um, the title, Mapping Out Your 2013 Journey with the Word of God from Matthew 4.4. 4. Um, and so, you know the outline already. I've given it to you several times. Um, and so I'm only going to write down the things that, um, that I need to write down. But why don't we go ahead and begin with a word of prayer. We usually begin with a prayer, short introduction, and then we go straight into the message. After the message, we conclude, um, give a call for those who want to be saved, and then um, we pray. So why don't we do that right now? Um, Father, I, I just want to thank you so much for the day. Lord, we come into your presence this afternoon. We ask you, Lord, to forgive us, all of us who are trying to walk in Christ and live for Christ. And Lord, forgive us of our sin nature and the sin that we commit. Father, those of us who are trying to adjust our lives to the circumstances that you've put us in, we pray, Lord God, that we would not lose sight of the cross, no matter how much we suffer, no matter what we're going through. Lord, let us not become embittered because suffering is there for you. Through Paul, Paul says that um, you have granted us um, the opportunity to suffer for your name's sake. And so being a Christian, um, part of that life that you've given to us in Christ um, includes suffering um, for the mighty name of Jesus. And so let us, Lord, be content in our weakness and let us be content in our difficulties and uh, for the next 350 days that are coming up Lord give us uh, strength and courage the same strength and courage that you told Joshua to have be strong and courageous I ask Lord for not only for myself but for the church and those who are listening to this message today may you be glorified in Jesus name and so, I, I want to um, quickly go, go back to um, to our introduction. Uh, 365 days, we have an opportunity to match our lives to the Word of God. But as I've said in the other videos, not only do we want to match our lives to God's Word um, during the course of our day-to-day -day journey with God, because we don't know what's going to happen during the course of the day, whether God is going to open up a door of opportunity or He's going to slam the door of opportunity closed and open up the door of misery or pain. Job and his family did not know that God and Satan had a conversation prior to um, him losing his property and his business, his, his wealth, his health, his children. He didn't know that a conversation had occurred and that God was going to test his integrity. And so sometimes God uh, doesn't give us any warning. And so that's why we have to constantly remain in the Word. And that's why that's another reason why we map out the Word of God. Um, mapping out our lives, our Christian life with God's Word. is because we don't know what's in store for us. We don't know what God is going to do on that specific day. And so... You know, we, we not only want to match our lives with what he teaches in the text as best as we can with the help of the Holy Spirit that indwells within. Um, and, you know, we want to have a Christian attitude and a Christian heart toward the life that we're living. We don't want to live as unbelievers. We want to live as believers, even in the midst of struggles and difficulties and, and sin. We want to stay focused and um, not lose the vision. Even when we stumble, you know, we want to get back up again. 
the scripture says in Proverbs, the righteous man falls seven times. But then what happens? He gets back up again, he takes himself off, and then he continues with his life. There's never a time where a person runs a perfect race. There's no such thing as a perfect race. We stumble. Even Jesus couldn't live down here for 33 years without, you know, dealing with Satan and demons and Pharisees and Sadducees and Zealots and um, Herod and, and people trying to hurt him and kill him and uh, call him Satan and saying that he has been, um, in, you know, he's influenced by demons. I mean, even Jesus, our Lord, had his confrontations with the devil. How much more us? Um, and so we have to be prepared for all of that. So not only do we want to match our lives, but as I've said before, we also want to carry out the work of the ministry that he's given to us. And the work of the ministry is to make disciples, as you see in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Um, and I said that to map out our journey and take on the responsibility of making disciples, the question that um, we want to answer or the statement that we want to clarify is who does God want me to in terms of discipleship who does God want me to lead who does God want me to fellowship with who does God want me to save from their sin who does God want me to encourage who does God want me to build up who does God want me to rebuke because of a sin that they've committed or they're committing um, and it's insulting the church and 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 it's insulting God. Who does God want me to teach, spend some time with, who, and, uh, and, and impart knowledge of the faith to them? Who does God want me to fight? Um, not physical fight, because the scripture says that, um, that's how I got this right here, uh, the scripture says that uh, the bond servant, the Lord's bond servant must not be quarrelsome, but patient when wrong. And so God doesn't want us to get into a fist fight with anyone. Instead, what he wants is for us to fight the good fight of faith and be prepared to fight off the devil and the demons that are there, as Paul did in Acts 16. Um, who does God want me to pray for? Who does God want me to serve? Who does God want me to love? And who does God want me to exercise oversight over? It could be one person, or it could be a family, your own family, or a group of Christians where you shepherd them. And so in in matching your, your life to the Word of God, you also want to carry out God's work. Um, remember James 2 says that faith produces works and works produces faith. And so that we want to accomplish. So we've gone through um, the first three uh, points, which is God wants us to uh, lead, which is from 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. Um, 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, uh, Paul writes to Timothy and says, And the things you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And I also have made reference to Psalms 23.2, which says, He leads me besides restful waters. He restores my soul. This is David talking. And so I use those two references uh, to remind us as Christians that as we do the work of God, we must lead the church and the brethren in discipleship as God leads us through the Holy Spirit. Also, what, who, who does God want me to fellowship with? Um, remember Hebrews 10, 24, 25 says, And let us consider how to stimulate one another uh, to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more, as you see the day drawing near. So God wants us to um, be there on Sunday mornings uh, at the local church. I'm still in the process of looking for a church that is willing to support my ministry and my work, looking for Christians who know my situation and who are willing to step up and not sheep away. If the church sheeps away, then you have to ask yourself, where is the leadership of the Holy Spirit um, in the lives of these elders? Where is the leadership of the Holy Spirit in the life of the pastor of the church? Um, the reason why I say that is because anytime a stranger comes into a congregation, they're going to want to know the details. And sometimes the church knows more than enough information about the brother or the sister that they should be able to step in and say, we want to help, we want to pray with you, we want to pray for you, we want to make sure that um, you understand that we're in your corner. When the church doesn't do that, then you have to really wonder where the Spirit of the Lord is in that congregation. Where is the, the teaching of fellowship in that congregation and among the leaders of, of that church? So, who does God 
Um, so who is God calling his church to lead, to fellowship with, and to save? Um, we know that we lead uh, those who are saved, we fellowship with those who are saved, and then we save those who are lost. Uh, Romans 10, 9, and 10 says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, a person believes resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses resulting in salvation. So we talked about that uh, the last time that we met. And remember, we had trouble with um, the video, and we had to do it two other times. The first time, um, I spoke for about 55 minutes, and it didn't take. The second time, I spoke for about 4 minutes and 50 seconds. Um, and the last time it was for about 35 minutes on the same message. And so it was sort of redundant, but the last message we deemed the first one that was lost. Um, the video did record, but the voice for some reason did not. Hopefully this message, that doesn't happen, or else we're going to have to do it all over again. And that's something that we don't want, especially in a series of this magnitude. There are 12 lessons. And we don't want to repeat the same things over and over and over again. And you know, to tell you the truth, my life is not perfect, as Christ's life wasn't perfect, and Paul's life certainly wasn't perfect. And so sometimes you will find Bible teachers teach things, and then you read in the newspaper that there's tragedy in their lives, there's sin in their lives, or there's something that happens, and you go, "Well, you know, that guy's a Bible teacher. How did he end up in that situation?" Well, Paul was a, a, an epistle writer. And he was a preacher and a teacher, but look at how much misery Satan had put him through, right? And so, um, in writing, in, in, in preaching these, or teaching these, these, these lessons, you know, I'm going through it. And it's difficult to maintain, uh, you know, Christ as my vision constantly, daily, all the time, when I have the world pulling at me from one angle, the church um, and the Lord, and, of course, my own uh, bodily needs and, and, of course, the sin nature within me. And so I've got a lot of, um, lot of, lot of people to answer to, to uh, in different ways, even though I'm not necessarily directly in connection with them. I spend more time by myself. It feels as if I spend more time by myself than um, with a group of people. But I'm constantly around people and dealing with people indirectly. And that keeps me busy, and that keeps me on my toes. Um, but all of that to say that the message went that way because of issues that probably have caught up in my own life, and this was probably a perfect opportunity for those who oppose the teaching of the Word to hit the computer, and thus you have it. Hopefully that won't happen again, and they will exercise the grace of God over, over this uh, sermon series. And so... If we cover January, February, and March, what exactly uh, does God want us to do in uh, April, right? Who does God want me to encourage? Encourage in April. So if in January, we, um, God wants us to lead, in February, God wants us to fellowship, uh, and in March, He wants us to save, in April, what does He want us to do uh, in terms of discipleship? He wants us to encourage. In Acts 27, verses 33 through 36, I'm going to turn there, um, and also in 1 Thessalonians 5, 11, um, and Titus 2, verses 4 through 5, the verse that I chose is 1 Thessalonians 5, 11, which says, Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another, just as you also are doing. So Paul is confirming to the church at Corinth, and basically what he's saying is um, he's encouraging them to continue encouraging each other and build up each other just as they were already doing because word had come back to him that um, that's what they were doing as a congregation, that's what they were doing as a church. Now when you go to Acts 27 verses 33 to 36 the scriptures read until the day, until the day uh, was about to dawn, Paul was encouraging them all to take some food uh, saying today is the 14th day that you have been constantly watching and going without eating, having uh, taken nothing. Therefore, I encourage you to take some food, uh, for this is for your preservation. For not a hair from the head of any of you will perish. Having said this, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of all. And he broke it and began to eat. Uh, all of them were encouraged, and they themselves also took food. Now remember, Paul, um, in Acts 27, I want to, um, you know, make 
I want you to focus on, on the word there, encouraged you three times uh, from verses 33 through 36. Um, and he was encouraging the crew that was with him. He was arrested um, in Jerusalem because uh, he had gone into one of the temples to um, to sort of, I guess, purify himself. And he had brought some Greeks with him, um, some Greek Christians. When the Jews saw that, they were offended by his actions. And the result of it was he was arrested um, because they accused him of... Um, not purifying, but they accused him of defiling the temple um, with unbelievers um, and or with Gentiles. And so the Jews raised the ruckus and had him arrested. He was taken into stock and for years he was imprisoned uh, and he defended himself before um, kings and, and, and governors and, and they didn't release him until finally they asked, he asked to be brought uh, to Rome and stand trial before Caesar. And so this was the journey that he was in, and, and the Lord had touched the journey by giving them a storm. And in the midst of that storm, the Lord had spoken to Paul and told Paul that nobody was going to die, and that he was to instead encourage the men to take food and, and not be uh, faint-hearted, because they had to throw a lot of the cargo overboard. And so that's why... Uh, Luke here, who is the physician, but also the recorder in Acts 16, says, Until the day was about to dawn, Paul was encouraging them all. That means his companions and the Roman uh, guards that were there, and also the, uh, um, the uh, a lot of the prisoners that were being taken over to, to Rome. So he was encouraging them to take food, saying, Today is the 14th day that you have been constantly watching and going without eating, having taken nothing, uh, therefore, I encourage you, here's that word again, you take some food, for this is for your preservation, for not one hair, for not a hair, for this is your preservation, it says not a hair from your head, any of you will perish. And so God had assured Paul that no one was going to die, but the key there is that even in the midst of this long-term arrest and um, transfer from, um, you know, from all the way from Jerusalem to now to Rome, uh, Paul was given the signal by the Lord to encourage the men, not to cut down the men uh, or discourage them, but to encourage them, to build them up. Um, it was just, Now, if you read Paul's letter to Titus on the island of Crete, in, um, in Titus chapter 2, verses 4 through 5, even there, Paul encouraged Titus to um, encourage the, the women the older women to encourage the younger women. Um, let's go to Titus. In Titus chapter 2, verses 4 through 5, uh, Paul writes, it says, um, actually, let's start with verse 1, it says, But as for you, speak the things. Now remember, chapter 1 of Titus is his letter to, uh, to Titus in, in um explaining to him how to take out or how to appoint elders on the island of Crete. And um, and basically he gives them the qualifications of what to look for in employing um, those men and allowing them to serve as elders. Um, and sort of like uh, his letter to, to, for, to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3, there's the qualifications there, uh, the list of different uh, godly qualifications that the men were to have. Same thing here in the letter to Titus. But in chapter 2, and of course he explains that there is a problem with the Cretans. Um, they profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. But then he comes to, um, in chapter 2, he says, but as for you, that is, as for you Titus, as for you Christians under Titus's leadership, he says, but as for you, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Now he wants to make sure that Titus doesn't get mixed up with what the Cretans are and what the Cretans are doing. So he says, uh, but as for you Titus, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. And then he gives them, this is the standard by which you and the men of the church on the island of Crete are to, you know, first he gives them the qualification, he shows them what the problem is, and then he says, now, for older men, this is how they're to be. For older women, this is how they're to be. Younger men, younger women. 
And so he breaks them down and he shows them this is the Cretan side, this is who they are, this is what's being said about them, and this is our side, the church, this is who we are, and this is how we're to be. So in chapter 2 he says, But as for you, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in the faith, in love and perseverance. Older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, not enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, so that, and here's our verse, so that they may encourage young women, the young women, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subjected to their own husbands, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. The verse the, uh, that we really want to focus on is verse 4 where he says, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands. Encourage young women. What is the problem with young women in any society? Is it that they cannot love their husband? It goes back to um, Genesis chapter 3, what had happened there, and the curse that God had pronounced on women, that they would always be groping to take the lead um, over their husbands, always desiring their husbands. It's not word for word what I'm saying, but but then Paul corrects that in in First Timothy, and he says that the the woman should not be, you know, teaching um, or exercising authority. Um, and sometimes um, it's difficult for a woman to yield to a man when that nature is in her as a result of the curse. Because remember, it was the devil who beguiled her to stray away from um, obeying God and yielding to her husband. And so that nature is still in the woman. Um, to, and it is still also in the man to yield to the woman. Right. So we have a, a reversal of, of leadership here. The woman takes the charge because of the serpent, but the man yields Right? Why is it that Adam did not step up to his wife and say, hey, you need to yield to, to, to God and, and not sin? And what, why is it that he didn't do that? But instead he yielded. And so they both sinned. And they both put themselves under the serpent. So now, here it is. Paul here is encouraging the, the church through Titus um, that the women were to encourage the young women. The older women were to encourage the young women, not cut them down or dis discourage them, but to encourage the young women to love their husbands. And what comes with love? Submission. Right? What comes with love? Submission. To, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subjected to their, being what? Subjected to their own husbands. Not somebody else's husband, not somebody in the community, not to, um, you know, a good friend of the family, because we know what happens if the woman does that. We saw that in 1 Corinthians, I believe it's 1 Corinthians 5, where Paul had to rebuke, um, you, you know, uh, um, rebuke and also uh, turn someone over to Satan as a result of it. Um, 1 Corinthians 5, uh, because there was too much intimacy between a mother and a son or something like that. Um, if you know my own testimony, you know how I've dealt with that issue. And so, you know, Paul here is encouraging the women um, in these in these factors uh, to be subjected to their husbands so that the word of God will not be dishonored. So all of that the woman was to do so that God's word was not dishonored. So the three verses or passages that, it, you know, that backs up um, who does God want me to encourage? Um, Paul encouraged the crew in Acts 27 um, Paul also encouraged the Thessalonians church um, in 1 Thessalonians 5.11 and also he encouraged um, Titus on the island of Crete with Titus 2, 4 through 5 to encourage the, for the old women, older women to encourage the women. Um, now there are three questions, three, three points or three questions that I have that also pertains to um, who does God want me to encourage. The first is, what does it mean to encourage? Right? What does it mean to encourage? The word means to strengthen. Right? It means to strengthen, it means to build up, it means to lift up and to pull others, um, sort of like out of discouragement. You know, it, it, that, exactly what Paul was doing to the crew um, that was heading for Rome. You know, he's saying, look, I know you're tired and you're famished and, and 
some of you have probably just given up. But you got to eat something. You know, and so he's pulling them out of that spirit of discouragement. Uh, you know, that spirit of malcontent. Right? So the whole point of encouraging it is to strengthen the person and, and, and to take away the sadness of the heart, which usually leads to them either doing something bad or to themselves or to someone else. So keep that in mind. Um, so the word means to strengthen, to build up, to lift up, uh, to pull others out of discouragement, malcontent, and sadness. Um, like, Ti- like Paul says to Titus, older women uh, were to encourage you and strengthen, build up, and lift up the younger women. Um, and same thing with the, with, uh, with the church of Thessalonica. Um, he encouraged the Thessalonians church to encourage each other. You know, it's sometimes it's difficult to walk into a congregation, and sometimes you may not know all the faces of the people there because um, the congregation changes, right? Over the course, people move, new people come in, um, the older people, some pass away, and, and others, you know, they go into different parts of, uh, of the church, if, especially if it's a large church, a 10,000 member church. So sometimes it's kind of hard to encourage people because you don't know who they are. Um, but if you're in a small group or a Bible study, it's easier um, to encourage someone because you have you know, contact with them more often. And so the more you're in contact with Christians um, in a smaller setting, it's easier uh, to, to encourage them and to build them up. But if you're distant from them, like I'm distant from the church. I'm not as um, close-knit to them as I used to be in the 90s. Um, if I was part of a Bible study and under someone's teaching, it would be easier for the church to encourage me, but because I'm not in a Bible study, and it's me now doing the teaching, um, or taking a stab at the teaching, rather than my sitting under someone's um, daily or weekly or you know Sunday, every Sunday sitting under someone's teaching, um, it, it's more difficult to encourage the church. It's more difficult for the church to encourage me. Um, but I, I, I still believe the Word of God and that God wants us to be in a setting where we are there to encourage others and for others to encourage us. And so encouragement is very, it's, it's very important. Um, the Lord spoke to Joshua when there was the transition in the Old Testament. Out, when Moses was leaving and Joshua was coming in, um, God specifically told Joshua three times. And Joshua recorded it in his book. Um, be strong and courageous. Take courage, right? Be strong and courageous. You know, take strength and take courage to do the work that I'm calling you to do. And so, you know, God encouraged Joshua, and Joshua basically had to take the, the courage that God had given to him and the strength that God had given to him and impart it to Israel and those who were going to go to battle with him um, to obtain the territory that um, he had promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so they were going to need all the strength and all the courage that um, they needed in order for them to um, to do this work and, 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 and go to battle. Um, so we've answered the question, what does it mean to encourage? Uh, it means to strengthen, build up, lift up, to put others out of discouragement, malcontent, and sadness. Our, sec- question, our second question is, um, who practiced encouragement in the scriptures? Well, we know that God practiced encouragement in the scriptures. Paul um, encouraged those who were traveling with him in Acts 27. God informed Moses to encourage Joshua in Deuteronomy 3.28. If you go to Deuteronomy 3.28, Deuteronomy 3, Old Testament text, Deuteronomy 3. Encouragement is such a key factor in the Christian faith because we deal with so much um, so much opposition as Christians that you know we it's, you know if you're going to map out your your 2013 journey one of the things you want to do is you don't just want to lead and 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 and, um, and and fellowship and save people but you also want to encourage them right you want to strengthen them and come alongside them so Deuteronomy 3 verse 28 says uh, but charge Joshua and encourage him and strengthen him for he shall go across at the head of this people and he will give them as an inheritance the land which you see 
So God prepared Joshua through Moses, right? And Moses was his leading man. Moses was his vessel. Moses was his instrument. As remember, God told Paul that um, that he was his instrument. If you go to um, if you go to Acts chapter um, Acts chapter nine um, in the New Testament. The Lord told Paul that he was his instrument. And as his instrument, he was going to use him. I think it was through Ananias. Um, in Acts chapter 9, he says to him, um, and so this is what Moses was, and this is what Joshua had just become. He says um, in Acts chapter 9, he says, Therefore he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. When someone has that much suffering coming up, how much encouragement do you think they need? Paul knew what he was talking about when he was talking about encouragement. Because he had been burned. right? Paul had been burned on several occasions. And that's probably the reason why the scriptures here in Deuteronomy 3.28, the, the baton, the mantle of work was being passed on from Moses to Joshua. And not only the load of work, but what does God say to Joshua? Not only are you to give him the load of work and the responsibility, but you're also to encourage him. Why? Because he's the one that's going to be leading the people into the promised land. He says, so charge him, encourage him, strengthen him. Um, because he's going to be the one to bring the people across um, the, uh, the the water and into uh, the new territory that I have for him. Remember, Paul wrote to Timothy, weeping and crying, that everybody had deserted him. Right? Uh, everybody had left him behind. Uh, Janus and Jambres turned against him. Uh, and so Paul had many years of discouragement sitting in jail um, with no one to encourage him and to build him up. And so that's a principle that he had to learn. That's something that it didn't just pop out of a, a, a of anywhere for him. He had to literally shake off the difficulties that he had uh, been enduring, and you know, sort of like knock himself and say, "Hey, you know what? I, I can't. I can't let this. You know, I can't let this thing affect me. I gotta. I gotta rise above this. I gotta. I gotta go beyond the the call of duty." Um, and he had to sort of like reverse the whole thing and um, and, and say, "Wait a minute." You know, I work for the living God. And, um, and he had to remember the words of the Old Testament and the New Testament and the words that God had given to him. And, and in doing that, to encourage himself. That's why Jesus says, physician, heal yourself. Right? And we have to do that a lot as Christians and those who do the work of the ministry, those who teach the word of God. We have to heal ourselves often. We have to pray and, 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 and quote scripture to ourselves and remind ourselves because nobody else is going to come alongside us, right? Um, sometimes God don't send angels. Now, remember Jesus right before he was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the Lord sent an angel to encourage him and to build him up because his heart was faint. And he said to, the Lord, he said to God, you know, is there another way? I mean, it's just like, man, I really don't want to go through this. I don't want to be crucified, even though he knew he had to be. But yet his heart was discouraged. And the Lord sent him an angel to strengthen him. So here, who, you know, our second question is, who practices encouragement in the scriptures? Well, we know God does. We know um, Paul does. Um, also, in 1 Samuel 23.16, Jonathan encouraged David, right? You go to 1 Samuel 23.16, and the scripture says, um, 1 Samuel, Samuel 23, 16. And the scripture says, um, And Jonathan's sons saw, arose, and went to David at Horesh, and encouraged him in God. Now, um, thus he said to him, Do not be afraid, because the hand of Saul, my father, will not find you, and will be uh, king over Israel. And uh, you will be king over Israel, and I will be next to you. And Saul, my father, knows that also. What was the problem? David was called of God to replace Saul. Why? Because Saul was a stubborn-minded man, and he didn't want to do what God had called him to do. 
um, apparently in the Old Testament somewhere, he was supposed to kill Agag, one of the king, Gentile kings, and wipe out and annihilate the entire city and the animals and the people. And um, Saul didn't do that, so it upset the Lord. And um, the Lord departed from Saul, and David was chosen to be the king of Israel, which would not happen for 40 years, not until he was in... Um, not until after Saul had reigned over Israel for 40 years. But what Saul lost was um, not the kingship, but the, the passing on of the kingship from himself to his son Jonathan because of his disobedience. And when David inherited um, that gift, Saul became angry and judged him and wanted him killed. And so here in the passage, um, he couldn't sit at the table uh, where Saul was sitting and Saul had asked, uh, you know, I guess the, the table, where is David? And, um, and David was not there, and, and his son Jonathan um, had to go out to him and, and speak to him. Um, I think that's the, the, the above. I didn't read the, the verses above, but, um, um, but it, that did happen with David and um, Jonathan. But here in this passage, the scripture says that... Um, First Samuel twenty three sixteen, that uh, David, that Jonathan went out to David and encouraged him in God. And so, a lot of interpreters, people say that Jonathan and David had a homosexual relationship. Not necessarily. I mean, they could have loved each other uh, very much because that's just what we're called to do anyway. Um, and you know, and so I think um, the the text here is clear that it wasn't God; it wasn't the Lord that the love that they had shared with each other was confirmed. So that's why he, couldn't, he encouraged him as a fellow Hebrew brother. So who practiced encouragement in the scriptures? God does. Paul did. Um, Jonathan. Um, Moses. So, you know, those who believe God practiced encouragement. I mean, to sum it all up, people who believe God practice encouragement. Why? Because they're encouraged by God and His Word. When they look at creation, they're encouraged. They don't feel like they're by themselves. They know that the Lord is there um, watching over them. So those who believe in God practice encouragement. Those who are encouragers know God's sovereignty. Here's something. Those who are encouragers, anytime you know someone who is an encourager, it's because he knows the sovereignty of God. and He knows that God is, is the beginning, he's the middle, and the end. God is the final, he has the final say-so. And so why worry? Why fret? Right? Remember Jesus says in Matthew, uh, be anxious for nothing, right? Because of what? Jesus is encouraging. Um, Jesus encouraged. Why? Because he, he is the sovereign Lord. He's the sovereign God. And um, I think it's in Matthew 6. Why don't we go there for a minute and uh, look at Matthew 6. And in Matthew, he says, Don't worry about about tomorrow for tomorrow will care for itself each day has enough trouble of its own right don't worry about uh, what are we going to eat what are we going to drink what are we going to wear even the Gentiles eagerly seek such things for your heavenly father knows um, that you need all these things but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you so what is Jesus disclosing there Jesus is basically showing that he has sovereign knowledge of God and that God the provider will provide everything. So don't worry. You know, be encouraged. Be strengthened. Be strong. Um, and uh, take away all that sadness out of your heart. Do not focus. That's why the scripture calls us to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter. Set our mind on the things above. But well, that's to encourage us. If our mind is on God and our mind is on Christ and our mind is on truth, then discouragement will not enter our hearts because our mind is on those who are leading the human race and the universe. Our mind is out of this world. But when we gear and focus on the things of this world, what happens? We become discouraged. Right? We become discouraged and we lose faith and we lose sight. And and some people go as far as committing suicide and taking their lives. Why? Because they took their eyes off of Christ. Um, and they began to worry. Uh, that's why the text says here, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. The same God that's shining the sun today is the same one that will shine the sun again tomorrow. Um, so those who know, those who are encouragers, they know God's sovereignty, that God has predetermined all of life's event. Therefore, you know, in the midst of adversity, there's no need to fear. 
Um, but instead, trust in, in, in His Word and trust in the Lord. Right? Why? And, that's, and, and with that, we're able to encourage others. We're able to build up others and strengthen others. Right? If we are strengthened by God, where do Christians get their source of strength from? From the Lord. Right? I lift up my voice unto, I lift up my eyes unto the hills. Where does my help come from? It comes from the Lord, maker of heaven, maker of her earth. Where does my help come from? It comes from the Lord, says the song and the psalmist, right? Everything that we are, everything that we have comes from the Lord. We are strengthened by the Lord. We are encouraged by the Lord. We are built up by the Lord. We are the temple of the Lord. The Lord abides within us and He cleanses us. He purifies us. The Lord is I mean, he's here with us. How can we not be encouraged? That's why he sends us out into the world to make disciples of nations, to baptize them, to teach them um, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right? So with that, we're able to encourage others. Now here's the last and final question. Who does God want us to encourage today? Right? Who does God, in, 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 in carrying out the work of mapping out our... our, our mapping out... Um, our 2013 journey with the Word of God, right? Who does God want us to encourage today? Who does God want you to encourage today in your family? Your husband, your wife, your sons, your daughters, your son who's, who has a football game next week, this Friday, right? And he's praying to God that, you know, their team win. Um, your daughter who has a recital, your grandparents who has an operation, um, a test coming up, a job application pending, uh, a mother out there it's about to give birth to twins, right? Who does God uh, want you to encourage? You know, there are so many people out there uh, that need a, a encouragement. Hospitals have people every floor that are weeping and crying because of what? Sickness and disease that are in their bodies. And what do you think they need? The encouragement of um, of those that are there that are healthy to say, hey, you're going to make it through, you're going to be cured. You know, this, this operation is going to work, right? And so, that's that. Those people are in need of encouragement. Um, 1 Thessalonians 5.11, as we quoted earlier, you know, other Christians, you know, one another. Paul says, um, we're to encourage today. Um, the faint-hearted, Right, First Thessalonians five fourteen. Let's go back to that that text again in First Thessalonians five fourteen. It's in the New Testament. It's one of Paul's letters, and it's in a sort of like in the latter part of um, right before Timothy, First Thessalonians um, five fourteen, and and Paul says to the church at uh, Thessalonica, he says, "We urge you." Uh, brethren, now remember, Paul is never by himself completely, right? He usually has a, a few men with him, and and he says, "We urge, we urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, um, help the, the weak, be patient with everyone." Now, sometimes I find myself not always encouraging, right? Sometimes I rebuke the people who I love because of sin that they've committed or sin that they've caused me to commit. Right? And other times I'll encourage. I don't discourage every single day. And sometimes I have to cut them down and rebuke them sharply. Why? Because of sin. Sin that they cause me to fall into or sin that they commit that offends and affects me. And But Paul says here, who is it that we're to encourage? We're to encourage one another. We're to encourage the faint-hearted. You know, the people whose heart are not as strong in the faith and in the Lord as the Apostle Paul. And those people, um, he writes to the church at Thessalonica and says, hey, make sure you encourage those people, okay? Those that are faint-hearted. Um, thirdly, the discouraged, right? You go to Ezra 4.4 4 and Nehemiah 6.9. Ezra 4.4. 4. That's in the Old Testament. Remember, Ezra was the, uh, was the scribe who came back um, Ezra was the scribe that came back with um, with the people um, from exile. So in Ezra four four, the scripture says, uh, "Then the people, then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah 
and frighten them from building. Right? We don't want to frighten people from doing God's work. We don't want to discourage them. We don't want them to you know, we don't want to push them away from doing the work of God. We want to encourage them, not discourage them. Um, and here in the text, the Jews were discouraged because their enemies didn't want them to rebuild the temple that was destroyed um, in 2 Kings 25. And so after 70 years of captivity and 70 years of enslavement to, to the king of Babylon, the Jews come back and what do they find? <laughs> they can't rebuild their temple. Why? Because the neighbors wanted to join in and they said, no way, man, we, can, we can't have you come in and, and join us in, in building the temple. That's, that's for our Lord. That's for our God. You know, they're, they're not Jews like us. And he's specifically asked us not to associate with you Gentiles. Right? And I'm sure they didn't say all of that. But what I wanted to show you is that they were discouraged. So there's not always encouragement in the faith. Sometimes there is discouragement. And so, but God wants us to encourage the discouraged, right? And if you go to Nehemiah 6, 9, and it's the same thing, when they were rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem, they, uh, they were discouraged from rebuilding it. By whom? By the Gentiles. Um, the hopeless. You go to Ephesians 2.12. Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, and uh, he's reminding the Christians there that, especially the Gentile Christians, he says in Ephesians 2.12, in Ephesians 2.12, he says, and he's reminding them, look at verse 11. Verse 11, he says, Therefore remember that formerly you were Gentiles. Right? He's talking to the Christian Gentiles. Uh, he says, um, remember that, that formerly you Gentiles in the flesh who are called on circumcision by the so-called circumcision which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the uh, covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Right? And so, they were hopeless. Hopeless. What do you want to do with the hopeless? You want to give them hope. Right? In verse 12 he says, having no hope and without God in the world. People who are without hope and they are in the world and they don't have God often get discouraged. That's the reason why they, they take up armor or they take up drugs, or they take up, you know, strong drink to sort of like revive, rekindle. You know, Paul writes to Timothy, Timothy, and he says, rekindle afresh the gift of God which is within you through a laying on of hands. And and so, you know, Paul tells him, um, tells the church there, and he reminds them that uh, the hopeless also means, you know, remember you are hopeless. But now you have hope in Christ. And so, who does God want us to encourage today? Um, one another, other Christians, the faint-hearted, the discouraged, the hopeless, the lost and unbelieving. The lost and unbelieving. That's why Jesus says, go into all the world. And do what? Encourage them. Make disciples of them. Baptize them. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teach them to observe all that I command. Because I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Remember how I, I healed the sick? Yeah. Fed the poor? Yeah. Open the eyes of the blind? Yeah. Go and do the same. And, and teach them everything that you can remember that I taught you. So, the lost and unbelieving to trust in God. Right? 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 21. What does that say? The scripture says, um, so Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, and he says, 17 through 24, he wants it. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is what? A new creature. So he's reminding the church of Corinth that he's a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Right? Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting the trespasses against them, and he has committed to us, the church, the word of reconciliation. Right? Therefore, looking at verse 20, right? therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, 
as though God were making an appeal through us. God is making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. That's encouragement. We are begging you. Be reconciled to God. We are imploring you. We are asking you. We are, please, be reconciled to God. I'm encouraging you to be reconciled. I'm not forcing you. I'm not beating you. I'm not threatening you. I'm not telling you, you know, I'm going to break your neck if you don't. I'm not just encouraging you. Be reconciled to your God. Do everything that you can possibly do through the course of your existence to be reconciled to Him by faith. To approach the throne of grace with boldness. To go before God in prayer. And if you've never prayed before, say, Lord, forgive me for my sin. And be reconciled to Him. If you're saying, oh man, this is a bunch of ridiculous Christian religious stuff. No, it's not. That's exactly what Jesus wanted us to do when He sent us out into the world. Go and encourage Him. Because you know what? The devil's not going to do it for you. The devil's not going to sit there and, and, and be your cheerleader. We're to be the cheerleader of the world. We're to stand on the sideline and go, Come on, you can pursue him. Call on his name. Call on his name. Look in the scriptures. Look, look at all that he's made for us. He gave us the sun. He gave us the moon. He gave us the stars. Look at all this good food. Look at the bread and the cup that he's given to us. Right? Let me take a second here. For, I want to show you something. If we're... Speaking of the bread in the cup, all right? If we're going to encourage the world, and we're going to encourage the church, here's a form of encouragement right, that God has given to each one of us, and especially the church. This is a form of encouragement that Christ gave to us, right? He says to the church, right? Do this in remembrance of me. And uh, the church has done it. Now, remember, when we take the bread and the cup, guess what we're doing with each other as a congregation? When we do this, what are we doing here? Often people will do this and they don't understand that this also applies to encouragement. We're encouraging each other when we do this. Right? We are building up one another. I want to see if... Uh, I could stop you right here for a second. Um, I just got to grab something here real quick and sort of kind of remind you when we are meeting together on Sunday mornings and we do this, this is a form of encouragement. Right? This is a, a strong form of encouragement when we do this on Sunday mornings. If you really want to be encouraged on Sunday mornings, be there for the bread and the cup. Right? Be there for the bread and the cup. Why? Because this is the, the strongest encouragement. The body of Christ and the blood of Christ. The body and the blood. This is the strongest encouragement that our Lord could have given to us as the church. Do this in remembrance of me. Right? Let's do it together. When the church does this, right? What are we saying to the world? That we believe in the, in the atonement that Christ has done for us on the cross. And it's by faith. Right? That is the strongest form of encouragement that we can give to one another. Is to, it is to remind one another that he died and he conquered death. And that his body took the penalty for our sins. And his blood was shed. Our blood do not have to be shed for our sins. Our blood do not have to be shed. Why? Because Christ's blood was shed. He took the penalty. That is the strongest form of encouragement that there is that we can encourage each other with. To take communion, either at church, by ourselves, in our, in our families, at Bible study. Why? Because that's what God has given to us. To encourage one another remind each other of what he had done on the cross for our sin. So, the last question was, who does God want us to encourage today? He wants us to encourage one another, other Christians, the faint-hearted, the discouraged, 
the hopeless, the lost, the unbelieving, to trust in God. Right? Those who encourage are used of the Spirit because they have the gift of encouragement. Let's conclude. In uh, 2013, our, four, our fourth stop in our journey um, is the city of encouragement. Right? We're mapping out our 2013 journey with the Word of God. So our fourth stop in the month of March in our journey is to do what? To stop at the city of encouragement. The place where we lift up one another in the name of Jesus, for the sake of Jesus, to the glory of the Father. Right? We, the church, must continue right, to encourage each other or else Satan will enter our midst and set us one against the other to cause, to cause division. And discord. I have to read my my, um, my notes there for a minute, and let me repeat what I just said. It says, "The place where we, you know, in the city of encouragement, this is the place where we lift up one another, right? That this is this is the place where we lift up others in the name of Jesus, for the sake of Jesus, to the glory of the Father. Remember that we, the church, must continue to encourage each other, or else Satan will do what? Satan will Enter our midst, just like he did when Jesus was in the um, in the upper room with his disciples, and set us one against the other to cause what division, to cause discord, disharmony, right? To bring shame to the faith in our Lord, and to discourage or to bring discouragement, which leads to what unbelief, right? Discouragement, which leads to unbelief, and the denial of the scriptures and the faith. We don't want that. We don't want discouragement to come into your faith. We want brethren to be encouraged. We don't want them to um, lose sight of the faith. We don't want them coming in one way and leaving the same way. Because we're there to meet with Jesus. We're there to break bread. We're there to be encouraged. We're there to do the Acts 2, 42 to 43, all over again. Never do you want to go into a church discouraged and come out even more discouraged. Because it's like, wait, didn't you go there to meet with your God? Yeah. Didn't you go there to meet with the God who abides in you? Well, yeah. So then why are you still discouraged? How can you walk into a church where you met with God and you walk out of the church and you're still discouraged? Is it your lack of faith? Is it that you didn't repent of your sin? Is it that you didn't read the scriptures? Was God not present there? How can you walk into a fellowship discouraged and walk out even more discouraged? Did the brethren, were the brethren there yet? Did you speak to anyone? Did they encourage you? No, they didn't encourage me. Did they pray for you? No, they didn't pray for me. Do they know you? Well, yeah, they knew me. Or, no, I'm new there. Well, did you take the initiative to introduce yourself to anyone? Well, I'm a new believer, or I'm a new attender. They should have been coming to me instead. But you understand what I'm saying? Um, you don't ever walk into a congregation and um, discouraged with a heavy heart and not um, be blessed by the worship, especially when our eyes and our focus should be on God. Just the worship should have taken away the discouragement. The preaching of the Word should have taken away the discouragement. The time of communion should have been a reminder of why you're even there. I should have taken away the discouragement. The giving of the tithe, 10% of what you are and what he's giving to you, should have taken away the discouragement. Writing your name on that card and saying that I am a part of this fellowship should have taken away the discouragement. Knowing that you have brothers in, in, on your left, on your right, in front of you, behind you, that and you're all standing together in Christ, should have taken away the discouragement. The prayer time where the pastor is, 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 is praying, the announcements for Bible study, the announcements for upcoming events, the announcement to pray for one another, all of that should have taken away the discouragement. Why? Because you are in the kingdom among the kingdom's people. The people that are around you are the people, are the citizens of heaven, not the citizens of hell. And if you're rubbing shoulder with people on that level, 
how could you still be discouraged? And so why don't we close in a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for this day and um, pray that you would bless the church this week and magnify encouragement among the brethren. In Jesus' name, amen.